Hey everyone, Professor Davis here from ChemSurvival.com, the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. And you've probably noticed that my channel's been running a little bit slow lately, uh, and that is because I've been focusing my efforts on another project with the Great Courses, which we have finally finished production on and is now at press and getting ready to go on sale this fall, 2016. So that leaves me with some more time on my hands, and I'm going to spend that time getting back to my YouTube channel. And what better way to get back to that than by updating a few of my early offerings from 2013 when the channel first hit the web. So I figure also what better place to start with that project than with the periodic table itself. So without any further delay, here is the updated version of my history of the periodic table video. Enjoy. Hi everyone, Professor Davis here from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. And today I thought we'd talk a little bit about a brief history of the periodic table of the elements. One of the most iconic images in all of science. Our story begins with Thales. Thales was a Greek philosopher, a mathematician, and an astronomer. And he proposed that all matter in the universe was made of just one base substance, water. So, this theory begs an obvious question. If all things material are water, then how do we explain the amazingly diverse set of materials around us? They surely can't all be made of the same substance, can they? Now, Thales attempted to explain this by suggesting that water could take on varying states, such as botanical, physiological, meteorological, and geological water. These states, he claimed, in combination with one another, were a way of reconciling this question of how we have such a diverse set of materials in the universe around us. But Thales' ideas lost popularity after a few centuries when the Greek philosopher Empedocles postulated that there were actually four elements, including water, but also air, earth, and fire. He proposed that it was these four fundamental substances combined in various ratios that formed all the materials around us, and that just as these substances themselves are mixed in all other materials, so were their properties partially retained by the new materials that they comprised. In fact, it was Plato himself who first proposed that these fundamental substances be given the name elements. And Plato's most famous student, Aristotle, then attempted to make sense of these four elements and their properties by describing what he thought were a specific set of properties unique to each one. He theorized that water is cold and wet, air is hot and wet, earth is cold and dry, and fire is hot and dry. So Aristotle's system gives us a way to catalog these so-called elements in something more than just a simple list. He went beyond that by plotting these properties on two coordinates, one axis for hot or cold, and another for wet or dry. And in doing this, he created a now famous table of the elements as he understood them, in which those elements with similar properties fall into the same column or row of the table. In my example here, the wet elements share a column, and the hot elements share a row, and so on. Now, this is a far cry from the modern periodic table, but it may very well be the first attempt to organize elemental substances spatially based on their properties. And we'll soon see how this is relevant to the construction of the modern periodic table. But to do that, we're going to have to jump ahead nearly 2,000 years, just about up to the time of the Industrial Revolution. It's the French nobleman and scholar Antoine Lavoisier who's generally credited with discovering some of the first correctly identified elements known to man. Lavoisier decided to challenge the two millennia old idea that water, air, earth, and fire are elements, and here's how he did it. The first thing Lavoisier did was to acknowledge that if a substance can be broken down into simpler substances, then that original substance cannot be elemental. So, if a material can be decomposed, it's not an element. He used this idea to test the 2,000-year-old paradigm that water is an element. Lavoisier didn't know that water was H2O, but what he did know was that he could break it down into a gas by passing it over iron, and that the gas he collected could then be burned in air, which contains oxygen, to recover the water. 
But what he could not do was further decompose that oxygen and hydrogen that he had collected. So by chemically disassembling and then reassembling water, Lavoisier had proven that water is not an element. And by failing to decompose the hydrogen and oxygen he created, he was also able to correctly identify those materials as elements. Lavoisier also reasoned that if a substance can be physically separated into two or more materials, then that substance also cannot be an element. And he used this idea to put yet another classical element to the test, this time air. He was able to physically separate air into oxygen and nitrogen, but his best attempts to separate those into other materials failed. So Lavoisier had proven that water and air are not elemental substances, but that hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen in fact are. Lavoisier and his contemporaries continued work in this vein and were able to correctly identify and catalog approximately two dozen elements by the time of his death in 1794. But just like Aristotle, modern chemists don't tend to report these elements simply as a list. Instead, we organize them spatially based on certain properties. And to see how this practice was started, we need to jump ahead a few more generations. The genesis of the modern periodic table took place at the hands of a Russian chemist by the name of Dmitry Mendeleev. What Mendeleev noted was that if he took some of the elements of his day and lined them up in order of increasing atomic mass, a pattern emerged. He noticed that every so often at regular intervals along his list, the properties of the elements seemed to be repeating themselves. For example, lithium and sodium tend to have the same properties as do beryllium and magnesium, as do boron and aluminum, carbon and silicon, and so on. And this trend continued among most of the elements known to him in that day. So Mendeleev decided not to show the elements in a list, but instead to break the list just like a line of text in a paragraph, placing elements with similar properties within a column. And this created a grid of elements. Using this technique, Mendeleev was able not only to create a compact, information-rich table of the elements, but one which he could even use to predict the existence of certain yet-to-be-discovered elements as well. Mendeleev's table became a very popular tool for cataloging and understanding the elements. So popular that scientists have continued to use his technique, building on his table and refining it into what we know as the modern periodic table. Today, of course, the elements are listed in order of increasing atomic number, and the gaps from Mendeleev's table have long since been filled in. But it's all based on his ingenious, if not completely original, idea of tabulating the elements based on their properties. Starting with ideas as old as ancient Greece herself and working up to 2016, when four new elements will make their appearance on the table, the identification, characterization, and cataloging of elements continues. Thanks for watching everyone. I'm Professor Davis from chemsurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. I'll see you on my next video. Thanks for watching everyone. If you'd like to learn more about me or my projects, you can do so at the websites here. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you on my next video.